right, welcome to the first half of the overview of Classical Rome. You can see all the topics we're about to cover on this slide right there. As a reminder for these overviews, uh, you're going to be looking for the key vocabulary words. Focus on the big ideas that we're going to attach other information to in class. Now you can see here in this big map of the world, you'll notice it's the same one that we saw in the Greek videos. And that's because the Romans were kind of getting started at the same time as the Greeks, maybe a little delayed compared to uh, the Greeks and their development. But uh, this word, word over here is the, uh, the italics, and that is where you can expect uh, the Romans to pop up in this story. So you can see the Carthaginians are over here, the descendants of the Phoenicians, the Persian Empire is over here, the Greeks are all right there. Um, and what you'll see in just a minute is that uh, when you focus in on this area, this uh, Italian peninsula, there's some real advantages that Rome had in its development. And you can see that, first of all, it had these mountains to the north of it, right? So as Rome was developing in this peninsula, they were protected from invasion from the north, at least wasn't easy to do. And Rome is also centrally located in this Italian peninsula, so they have access to uh, both sides over here of the Mediterranean Sea, and that's really useful for trade and things like that. And you also have the ability to, if you were to control the whole peninsula, I don't know, like maybe the Romans would want to do that, uh, then you would be able to hold off invasions because it's much harder to invade things over the water. Now, after the collapse of Alexander the Great's empire, it split up into a bunch of different pieces. And Rome, over time, becomes the dominant civilization in all of the Mediterranean area. And you can see the development over here. And the darkest red is where Rome started, just the city of Rome itself and a couple outlying places, like its port over here at Ostia. And over time, they took over more and more of this land controlled formerly by other people, like the Etruscans and the Sabines and the Umbries and the, the Samnites and the Lucani and the Bruti and the, you know, all these other places, some of which were Greek, actually Greek city-states like Syracuse, uh, and some of which were you know, other cultures or similar to Rome. In any case, as they expanded, they used the really rich soil of this area to generate a lot of wealth and a lot of population growth so that then they were able to, you know, take over the majority of that peninsula. And you can see the key here for how far they had expanded by uh, the later wars that they had. So let's talk a little bit about how they did this. So we have evidence of habitation in the area of the city of Rome as early as 1000 BCE. And the Romans didn't necessarily say their history went back that far. They, they knew there were people living there for a long time, but they had their mythical founding date as 753 BCE. We know from archaeology that around 600 BCE is when the little villages that were on the different hills that then later made up the city of Rome sort of merged together around that time, and that is a pretty good date for the uh, archaeological founding of the city. And because their land was so fertile, and uh, because Rome, even in the early days, had some some drive towards this like independent mindset, the individual Roman citizens owned their own land, and that was the basis for their economy. If you were a citizen, ideally you owned land, you could support yourself, you could support the state, you could participate in wars, and if you wanted to rise through the ranks, then you would need to own more land. And at first they were led by kings, but the kings uh, made some rather unpleasant decisions, and the senators, who were the heads of wealthy families, who formed kind of a, like a council of elders, rose up and got rid of the last king and established a republic, which would last for a long time. You can see some really cool images here of uh, troops from the Roman Republic period, as imagined by a modern-day artist, and also the senator uh, Cato in the chambers of the Roman Senate, again, by a modern artist. So as Rome was rising, though, it brought it into conflict with some of its neighbors. So it got into conflict with Syracuse, with Carthage. Uh, Carthage, they were the descendants of the Phoenicians, which is why they're called the Punic Wars in the first place, by the by. Um, uh, Phoenicians, Punic, it's, it's Puniki, Puniki is the, the Roman uh, translation of that. So they get into a war basically over control of this region, especially control over Sicily and control over the uh, major trade routes and things in the area. So Hannibal was an important leader for Carthage, who we remember because he audaciously crossed the Alps. So he basically went uh, from Spain up and around on land into Roman territory and surprised Rome and like beat Rome back for many, many years. Eventually, though, the Romans outmaneuver Hannibal and uh, it, the wars result in a Roman victory and a destruction of Carthage. But that meant that Rome then controlled all of those areas that you see in dark 
purple here, suddenly that's Roman territory. Suddenly Rome has all of this trade that the Carthaginians used to control. Suddenly they have so much more land, more ability to get uh, the Northern Africa had really fertile land for growing more crops. And so uh, Roman culture spreads to those areas and Rome becomes a power player in the Mediterranean Sea area. And you can see here a key idea, the diffusion of Roman culture. Diffusion means that it was passing into other places, across the barriers that were there. Diffusion is uh, something passing across a barrier. So Roman society, like a lot of societies, is organized with the very powerful and wealthy at the top, and there are a few of them. In this case, they're called the patricians. And then in the middle were the plebeians. They're not as wealthy, but they were citizens. They often fought as foot soldiers, uh, and they had... Often, either they owned their own farms or ran uh, shops or were artisans. But you notice they couldn't intermarry during this time period. And there were also foreigners, and those people didn't have Roman citizenship, and so were limited in their political rights. If you were enslaved, you definitely didn't have political rights. And if you were a woman, you also didn't have a lot of rights in Roman society. Uh, and citizenship is uh, the big deal, the important idea here, which is if you wanted to be a Roman citizen, that meant that suddenly you counted among the people. And in Greece, if you were in the demos, the people, then you could vote on all the laws and rules. In Rome, what you did was you voted for an elected representative who would then vote on the laws and the rules. And even though the Roman Republican system wasn't some kind of utopia where everybody had equal rights and stuff like that, uh, that did set a pattern that later the founders of the United States would follow in setting up our government. So it's important to understand how their system worked and the ins and outs and flaws of it um, to better understand the establishment of our, what we'd call a, you know, a modern democracy. Now you can pause here to take a look at this really cool chart. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of it. I'll mention a couple of the important ideas, but as Rome was a representative democracy, there were a couple different uh, levels of the different structures within their government. So there were the assemblies, which was how all the, the people, all of the citizens were able to participate and vote for their representation in the assemblies. And that was lower than the Senate. Uh, the Senate was composed of current and past magistrates who served for life, uh, which was something that the early U.S. Uh, founders actually considered for our Senate. But the Senate and the assemblies were making laws and, you know, kind of arguing and fighting with each other. But the folks who had the most power, the maybe you'd call it executive power, were the consuls. And the consuls were two individuals elected yearly who managed army affairs and government and could veto each other. And so ideally, that would mean uh, they would never take power entirely, but it doesn't actually work out like that. And... Uh, the laws of the Roman Republic were codified in this thing called the Twelve Tables. It's a particular document we can still look at today. And the reason that's important is because they were public laws. Uh, you'll remember back to Hammurabi's Code uh, and the laws that were established in Athens. This is a similar situation. And some of the important ideas from Roman law are the basis for modern law today. So it's really important, like the idea of innocent until proven guilty, for example, where we, the prosecution has to establish that you're guilty. You're not just assumed to be guilty. Roman mythology, their beliefs about how the universe functions, is a lot like Greek mythology. They're polytheistic, having many gods, and it's really important. It was integral to their culture, politics, and art. Uh, they used these deities as a way of explaining the natural phenomena of the world around them and all the different things that happened, lightning, thunder, you know, the eruption of volcanoes very near where they lived. And you can see over here on the right-hand side that the Greek deities corresponded pretty well to specific Roman deities. And that was because the Romans adopted a lot of ideas from the Greeks and, in fact, uh, would bring over Greek tutors to tutor their children. And Greek uh, in the eastern part of the empire became the main language people spoke. So the Romans left behind a lot of contributions. These are from more than just the Republican period, but it's a, a good time to go over some of these. There was the Pantheon, an important temple in the city of Rome itself. Remember, this is not the Parthi Parthenon. This is the Pantheon. you got to keep those separate. The Colosseum, where gladiator fights and other spectacles took place. Uh, you have the ruins of the Forum there, but in its heyday, it was the main meeting place in the center of Rome, the center of civic life. The aqueducts, which carried water from distant places to where it was needed near the cities. And you can even see that 
there are these arches. And the Romans had developed a really fascinating way of creating arches so that you didn't have to just have flat areas held up by columns because arches are actually stronger than just flat column colonnaded areas and so you can build bigger and fascinating buildings uh, Ptolemy there is an astronomer from this Roman period who created a really influential vision of the universe and how all the planets and stuff worked which would basically remain the accepted version in Europe all the way up through the scientific revolution and medicine was also an area that Rome really excelled in. Well, particularly the like public health side of medicine. Uh, they had aqueducts, which brought in fresh water to reservoirs, which is a lot better than drinking whatever's in the river right now. And that meant people could drink from the fountains. They had baths uh, so that you could clean yourself. They had latrines so that you could, let's say, clean yourself. And then there were sewers, which, uh, which allowed all of the stuff from those places to leave. Just go ahead out into the Mediterranean Sea. And another important way in which Romans have influenced much later societies is because their language continues to be used today. Well, first of all, we definitely still learn it, and that comes through the Catholic Church, but also uh, you see that it's used as the basis for these modern languages like Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, Romanian. But I'll also tell you a lot of words in English come from Latin, partially due to the influence of the, you know, the church in the Middle Ages and the development of English. But um, those are called Romance languages from Roman, not from like romantic. And then finally, another important thing left to us by Rome is there's a lot of documents that we still have access to from the Roman period. And that includes Virgil's Aeneid, which is the mythical story of this Trojan uh, warrior who leaves Troy as it's falling to the Greeks, you know, after the whole like uh, Trojan horse situation. And uh, he flees and ends up in North Africa and then ends up in Rome. And it helps explain a lot of Rome's past in a, in a mythical way. So that's really cool. Uh, and we'll talk more about uh, how the Republic falls next time. So I hope uh, you're having a good day so far and I uh, hope you learned something interesting.